Hello, everyone, and welcome to Addressing the Threat of Ocean Sewage Pollution. This is the first webinar in a series of online activities and events about ocean sewage pollution, an enormous environmental problem that few people are talking about. My name is Kristen Mays, and I'm the Reef Resilience Network Manager and your host for the webinar, which is brought to you by the Nature Conservancy with support from the Reef Resilience Network and NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. During the kickoff webinar, Dr. Stephanie Weir of the Nature Conservancy will provide an overview of the issue of sewage pollution, how sewage impacts the well being of the environment, coral reefs, and coastal communities, and why we need to take action to mitigate it. Stephanie is TNC's senior scientist and strategy advisor and has been dedicated to the topic of sewage for the past eight years. She's worked to document its impacts on reefs bridge the gaps between the various sectors involved in and affected by sewage, and has advocated to bring this topic to the forefront of discussion. We're currently developing a body of resources for reef managers to address the threat of sewage. These resources will include web pages on the Reef Resilience Network Toolkit, case studies highlighting sewage monitoring and management strategies, and an online course to help managers build understanding on this topic and ways they can act. To inform this work, we surveyed reef managers and uh, um, practitioners in our network. 90 people responded to the survey, so thanks to those of you who contributed. Half were managers, including community leaders, and the other half were scientists. From the survey, we learned that 94% of the participants see sewage as a major or moderate threat to the ecosystem where they work. Of particular concern for respondents are disease risk for corals, water quality impairment, and increasing sewage pollution due to population growth. Despite that, only half of the respondents said their organization or agency is currently acting to address sewage. In the survey, managers asked for information on a variety of topics related to sewage, and there were requests for case studies and an online course. So this is really useful information. We will use this information, and then um, what we learn from you guys today on the webinar to, to guide the development of these upcoming sewage resources, um, and we'll be sure to share them out as they're developed. A couple of quick housekeeping items before I turn it over to Stephanie. Today's webinar will be one hour. Following the presentation, we'll have a discussion session. There are two ways you can ask questions. You can type your question into the question box at any time during the presentation as ideas um, or question or comments come to you um, or during the discussion session and um, we'll share those questions or comments for you. You can also raise your hand during the discussion session and we'll go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question aloud yourself. Uh, if you're, finally, if you're having any uh, technical difficulties such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please send us a message through that same question box and we'll try to resolve the issue. Okay, I will now pass it over to Stephanie uh, to begin the presentation. Thanks, Steph. Great. Thanks, Kristen. Um, so I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. Uh, this, you know, I have a long history with the Reef Resilience Network, and this feels a little bit like coming home. And I'm really excited to be with my coral reef peeps, kind of been off in the wilderness for a while. So thank you so much for tuning in. And as Kristen mentioned, this webinar marks the beginning of a longer series that is going to be devoted to sewage pollution. We wanted to start things off by providing some context for why we are going to be devoting so much time to the threat of sewage pollution. And with people signing up from more than 60 countries for this webinar, the interest you know, demonstrates the concern about this threat. So I'm really excited. I'm thrilled to have you all here today. And the short answer to the why is, you know, we just haven't been giving it enough attention. And by we, I mean the collective we. And so we're going to give this problem the attention that it deserves. And we're going to work to support those that are tackling this wherever they are working or those that want to start working on it. Next slide. 
Okay, so let's get into it. When I stepped away from my role with the Reef Resilience Network about eight years ago, I stepped into sewage pollution and how it impacts coral reefs. I actually ended up spending a few years working on a PhD to better understand the nature and extent of the threat to coral reefs and other ocean habitats. So why did I pause my career after 15 years and return to do a PhD? Well, for several years, I had had a nagging feeling that sewage was being ignored in the ocean conservation space. And despite being common wherever I worked. So a decade ago, the focus of our work at the network was on the use of marine protected areas, fisheries management. We were also starting to talk a lot about restoration, but very little of this work had anything to do um, or any kind of focus on water quality. So I was concerned about this because success in these areas is dependent on good water quality. So I wondered, you know, whether this lack of emphasis on water quality might be happening at a global scale. And after conducting some surveys of managers across the tropics, including perhaps some of you, I learned that most folks identify this problem as one of the big ones that they were facing. And Kristen just presented results from a survey done just in the past month that really mirror the results that I found. So what concerned me most was that managers reported that they were not putting anywhere near the time or financial resources towards addressing the threat compared to the effort and funding that was going towards other strategies like marine protected areas and fisheries. On average, I learned about two to three times more resources were being spent on equally ranked threats, also sort of mirroring what um, Kristen shared. So this seemed like a mismatch to me, that we recognized the problem and yet we weren't devoting resources to addressing it. So in my surveys, I also asked why this may be, and I got a range, excuse me, of answers but one of the things I heard and continue to hear is that there's a lack of awareness, lack of understanding, and, and lack of guidance on how to address the threat. There are also funding issues and government mandates in play that are really important there. So I set out on a course to better understand the space and how we could do a better job of addressing water quality by reducing sewage pollution. Now we're at the point where we can finally start sharing what we've learned with you. Next slide. So one of the most frustrating aspects of research, of my research, was that there was very little out there that clearly linked sewage pollution to degraded ocean habitats, despite the obvious. So I wrote a review paper on this, and we will be sharing that with you on the forum after today's call. The broad assumption was that it's a problem because, you know, it's intuitive, it's, it's, it's obvious but it was largely ignored in the literature and even in some high level global ocean threat assessments it was omitted, including the Ocean Health Index. I'm happy to report that this is changing and that the Ocean Health Index team will be publishing a wastewater threat layer in the coming months and it will show the significance of this threat to ocean health at the global scale. So my dissertation work revealed that sewage pollution was like overfishing and climate change, a pervasive and strong driver of coastal ecosystem degradation and it became clear that this issue was largely being ignored at a meaningful scale. So these findings begged for an effort to figure out how to help these managers that are experiencing the problem, but are struggling with solutions or support from decision makers or funders to take the necessary action. So before I get into the fun part and talk about resources and solutions that are on the horizon, I wanted to give you a quick primer about the impacts of sewage pollution on coral reefs and other ocean habitats and also just how prevalent the problem is. Next slide. So first to talk about the scale and the scope of the threat. Most of you probably know that mapping threats is a huge challenge we face in conservation and mapping something that is not necessarily a point source is even bigger. So for the purposes of my research, I really just wanted to know how common this problem was across the tropics. So I did a literature survey and I looked at all 112 coral reef geographies, and this includes countries, territories, and states, any place that was distinct geographically. And of those 112, only 108 actually have people present, even if it was a small population. So I only looked at those 108, and of those, 104 had a documented sewage pollution problem. I didn't measure the magnitude of this problem. That's something that really does need to happen at the local or regional scale. And we should, we should actually have a better sense of this once the Ocean Health Index publishes their new model later this year. A quick aside, um, I, I should note that we hope to have that team share their findings with this network as part of this webinar series. It's going to be a very valuable addition to the Ocean Health Index. 
which has become a scorecard really for, for many countries tracking their management of ocean health. So stay tuned for that. Uh, next slide. So one of the things one of the things that I think is really important to highlight is that this wasn't just a developing world or tropical problem. We're in very good company. That this was a problem everywhere, including places that we assume have lots of high-tech infrastructure like New York City or Seattle. What we know is that about 80% of the world's sewage is discharged untreated. In some places, those numbers are even higher. So almost every geography has a documented sewage pollution problem. This is universal. But how is it impacting coral reefs? Next slide. So if I were able to take a vote here today, I'm guessing that most of you would think that the problem of sewage pollution is excess nutrients or eutrophication, too much nitrogen and phosphorus in the system. We're all familiar with the impacts of eutrophication. We get macroalgal overgrowth that smothers slower growing organisms like corals or other benthic invertebrates. We get harmful algal blooms that cause anoxic or hypoxic events resulting in fish kills and dead zones. We know that in systems like coral reefs, they are by definition low in nutrients and require clear water for coral reefs to thrive. So added nutrients spells trouble. I think we all know that. So me telling you that sewage pollution contributes to eutrophication and problems with algal blooms is not a surprise. Based on the results, it sounds like the survey results that you guys did, it sounds like there's also this broad understanding of the potential for sewage pollution to contribute to disease. Next slide. So while it is challenging to determine the cause of many diseases we see, we've see we been seeing popping up on coral reefs, more than I care to think about right now, really, um, we are starting to see some evidence to linkages to coastal pollution, and in at least one case, a clear connection to human sewage. There's a study published about a decade ago that, that showed that white pox disease, a common disease on acroporid corals in the Caribbean, um, this disease is caused by an opportunistic pathogen found in the human gut that is associated with hospital acquired infections such as respiratory illness and gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal illnesses. So this is actually a pretty big deal to have transference of a pathogen from human to marine invertebrate. This is the kind of evidence you can use to rally stakeholders and decision makers to call for action to mitigate the threat. It's possible that other coral diseases have direct linkages to humans, but we know that there are also indirect linkages. For example, based on recent studies in the last decade by Dr. Rebecca Vega Thurber at Oregon State University, we know that corals are more susceptible to disease and bleaching when exposed to excess nitrogen and phosphorus associated with sewage pollution. That particular study came out when I was working on my dissertation, and I don't think I have ever been so happy to have read a research paper because it really demonstrated these linkages so clearly. So I'm also happy to share those resources on the forum after this webinar as well. Next slide. So in addition to pathogens and excess nutrients, sewage typically contains a range of other harmful contaminants, including heavy metals, hormone disrupting compounds, and pharmaceuticals, which are we're really just beginning to learn more about. Endocrine disruptors come from pharmaceutical hormones, but they are also found elsewhere, and the, the big offender being plastics or plasticizers and microplastics. They're all finding their way into household sewage, which also includes detergents and personal care products, which can also have endocrine disruptors in them. So these are compounds that disrupt the hormone systems in animals, including corals. There is evidence showing that corals metabolize steroidal estrogens. They take them into their tissues and skeletons, and they're finding that it reduces their reproductive capabilities and it modifies both growth rates and how they grow. Heavy metals are another common component of sewage and they do the same thing in the marine environment that they do to us. They interrupt enzymatic processes and accumulate in our tissues and skeletons or the corals tissues and skeletons, creating a range of problems both in the marine environment and in people. Finally, what is in sewage varies widely depending on the place, but there are generally an array of toxins that end up in household sewage. You just can't name them all. Pharmaceuticals are a very much a growing concern, specifically thinking about antibiotics. Most people are exposed to antibiotics in their daily lives, either through medicines or food. For corals, this is of particular concern because of the microbial community and the mucous membrane on the surface of corals, like their own microbiome. 
The current thinking is that this microbial community provides various services to the coral, especially in protection from disease. So exposure to antibiotics has the potential to disrupt this microbial community and make the coral more susceptible to disease. Next slide. Okay, so each of these components on their own can have a negative effect on marine life, but in combination, they have the potential to interact with each other and amplify their effects. For example, both heavy metals and excess nutrients can increase the virulence of harmful pathogens. So the mechanism underlying the impacts of sewage on corals is complex. We have to start looking at sewage pollution as a multiple stressor rather than a single stressor. It's a toxic cocktail of nasty things, each having very specific and potentially fatal impacts. Next slide. So I wanna give you just a, a few specific examples of the impacts some of the components of sewage can have on coral reef communities at different organizational levels. Next slide. And these are basically, you know, I'm breaking it down to different, some of the components I've already mentioned. So this isn't sewage as a whole, but you, we basically, I had to break it down into parts because there was so little research out there on sewage as a whole, which makes sense, sewage is complicated. So at the individual level, the impacts these different components have on corals varies widely, including impacts to physiology, ranging from how the coral grows to photosynthetic rates to death. Next slide. Reproductive capabilities can also be impacted by these individual components, including reducing the amount of sperm and egg bundles produced and fertilization success. Okay, next slide. And finally, at the community and population level, these components can impact biodiversity, coral cover, and disease. A whole range of really important things for coral function. Next slide. So besides the fact that this is a big ocean problem, there was another reason I was drawn to this challenge and actually did a PhD on sewage, which was people. And the impacts on, on human health and well-being are significant. There is a global sanitation crisis happening with over 4 billion people without access to safe sanitation. That's there's two and a half billion people that don't have a toilet. So the rest of them, the, the other two billion don't have safe access. So children are the most impacted with about 800,000 children under the age of five dying every year to diarrheal disease associated with unsafe sanitation. That's 2,200 children every day. Many more people are getting sick, they become disabled, they must work, and they're economically impacted. These issues are all interconnected. When you have people getting sick, and in some cases even dying from a polluted environment or dirty water or contaminated food, you lose both the contributions of those people to their community as problem solvers, but also put greater pressure on the environmental resources due to intensification of poverty and associated illness and disability. Next slide. So women and girls are particularly impacted with many girls dropping out of school at puberty because there is no toilet at school. When you get down to it, women and girls are the biggest losers here. There is a concern from a humanitarian and gender equity perspective here, but it is also a concern from an environmental perspective. A recent study called Project Drawdown looked at the top 100 solutions for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And they found that by empowering women and educating girls, you could reduce more greenhouse gas emissions than any other solution they found. So if you're worried about climate change and or ocean health, like I think everybody on this call is, toilets and schools are a definite priority. In fact, when you review the 17 sustainable development goals, solving this problem is tied to almost all of the United Nations goals. So this issue is integral. And what I love about solving this problem is that there are all of these co-benefits that go well beyond ocean health, including reduced dependence on fossil fuels, food security, and poverty alleviation. Some of these co-benefits can be illustrated in some examples, in some example solutions that I want to share with you today. I want to emphasize that there are many ways to solve these problems, and I'm sharing some toilet and, tech and treatment tech just to give you a little taste of the innovative ideas currently in the works. Next slide. So the good news in all of this is that we can work with and learn from the public health sector, from those that have been working in this space for decades. 
over the last decade or so, there's been a bit of a toilet revolution, which is actually what finally inspired me to step away from my job and get my PhD in sewage. In um, 2012, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation started the Reinvent the Toilet Initiative. And they challenged inventors and engineers and really whoever to design a toilet that didn't use water, electricity, or septic, that operated on less than five cents a day, that produced a valuable resource like drinking water, for fer drinking water, fertilizer, or fuel. And finally, and most interesting to me, that did not pollute the environment. So this is like a dream toilet. And I saw this as a win, win, win. And it got me revved up and wanting to learn more and figure out how we might partner with groups working in this space. Next slide. Okay, so a few examples of new sanitation tech. Here is a system that transforms the dirty water into drinking water. They call this toilet to tap. I know it sounds delicious to you. Um, this isn't just a small scale solution. There are actually some great examples of this working at larger scales, including Orange County in Southern California. Next slide. So here, this is a toilet that turns waste into electricity. And I love the fact that your trip to the toilet can actually reduce your reliance on fossil fuels. Talk about a win-win, especially in countries where access to affordable and clean energy is a problem. Next slide. Okay, so this is a contraption that creates biogas that is clean and can be used in cook stoves, which reduces indoor air pollution, another big human health challenge. Again, wherever there are multiple benefits with a solution, the more powerful your case when engaging with stakeholders and decision makers. People need to see how what matters to them is positively impacted by taking action in this space. Next slide. Okay, so there are also some great examples of natural solutions too. There's many, I'm only gonna cover one. Um, we call this sanitation by and for nature. This is a constructed wetland schem schematic that costs much less to build and operate than conventional treatment solutions and provides multiple benefits to the system besides treating wastewater. For example, something we care very much about, habitat. Um, the Nature Conservancy is actually participating in a working group right now that is focusing on such nature-based solutions and is developing guidelines for sanitation managers so that they can make informed choices about using natural solutions to meet their sanitation goals. So once that tool is available, we'll be sharing it in the forum as well, and as well as um, in the new sewage, sewage pollution module on reefresilience.org. Next slide. Okay, so you get the idea. This is actually uh, what a constructed wetland ends up looking like. Um, innovation is happening. So when I visited the Gates Foundation back in 2012, I wanted to know if they were aware of the environmental benefits of this toilet revolution that they had inspired. Um, and they said that they realized they were likely, there were other benefits, but they were really focused on restoring human health and dignity, which is totally understandable and obviously very important. Since then, we've continued to learn from their work and they've been very generous with their lessons learned. Next slide. One of the things I learned early on from the Gates team was that this wasn't just tech solutions, so tech problem to solve, that it was complicated and that there were all these social factors at play, including social acceptance, economic affordability, maintenance issues, and gender considerations. Tech is only one piece of the puzzle. And right now, it feels very much like a puzzle. It's important to remember that innovation isn't just about tech. It's about behavior change. It's about social norms. It's about rallying community support. In fact, there is a new solution search being launched in a few weeks on solutionsearch.org around behavior change related to ocean pollution. The Nature Conservancy, along with a diversity of other partners, is involved with this effort. And if you're working in this space, I would encourage you to submit your work to the contest. If you don't submit, I still encourage you to follow the contest as the winners are selected over the next several months so you can follow their work and learn more about creating behavior change around these issues. So much of it is around behavior change. We'll also be, to sh be sharing any significant lessons learned or new approaches that come from the search. Next slide. Okay, so you're getting a sense of the complexity of the solution space and probably wondering where to begin if you haven't already started working in this space. I would encourage you to start with figuring out the potential for partnerships where you work. 
This work requires cross-sector cross partnership. And I'm assuming that most of the people tuning in today are not sanitation managers and probably don't have decision-making power in the sanitation space. So these problems cannot be solved by conservation and natural resource managers alone, nor can they be solved by, the public, health, by public health or WASH sectors or the development sectors. Each sector has an important role to play. And I should say WASH, for, I know this might be a new term for folks, it means water, sanitation, and hygiene. And it's an easy acronym that also reminds one of them, you know, reminds us to wash our hands and the importance of that. And I think we all have learned the, uh, that at another level in, in, um, in the last six months, how important it is, personal hygiene. So while it may seem intuitive to someone working in ocean conservation and management, the dumping sewage into the ocean is a problem. For those in the sector I just named, often their goal is to get sewage to the ocean. That is their solution. The assumption is that dilution is the solution to pollution. And our job is to correct that assumption and stop the ocean from being a dumping ground. So working with these sectors is critical to any mission that aims to reduce ocean sewage pollution. It is also important to seek out partners in sectors that are dependent on clean water, whether that be manufacturing or tourism. Learn who cares about clean water in your community. We understand that working with new partners can be challenging, even intimidating, especially when the vocabulary and perhaps the mission is unfamiliar to you. So during this webinar series, we will be devoting some time to learning more about sectors and partners that are relevant but new to our traditional conservation work. For example, we will do an entire webinar on WASH. We'll break it down to understand the nature of this work, the challenges they face, and some of the solutions most commonly used hearing directly from WASH practitioners firsthand to make reaching out to your local partners and your local WASH practitioners easier. We will also do a webinar, actually the very next one, will be on Wastewater 101. So you can get to start to get some fluency in this space. And this will all ultimately be complemented by a module and a, a new course in the, in the coming months. Next slide. Okay, so I have personally been trying this out, going beyond the conservation sector and working with others. And last fall, we gathered a small group of representatives from multiple sectors to help us figure out exactly what our role was in a space that already felt crowded with public health, engineering, development, WASH, and more. We were trying to figure out what our entry point would be, and the, sort of largely the conservation entry point, and, and how we really could contribute to a so solution space that was you know, had decades of work already underway. By the end of the workshop, we were clear that there were many entry points and that we had a really important role to play as the voice of the ocean. And it's really been a missing voice until now. So that was the good news. The challenge, not the bad, the bad news, but the challenge we have is that this voice is very small right now. And this is familiar to you guys. Uh, the voice of the oceans is, is not nearly big enough in general. And we just can't solve a problem that people don't know exists. So in order for us to be successful working across sectors, working with governments, working with communities on the ground, first people need to know that what has been the mantra and practice for decades, perhaps centuries, that the solution to pollution is dilution, is just plain wrong. So it's time to make some noise. Your stakeholders need to know how their waste is being managed or mismanaged, as the case may be. Your stakeholders need to know how this impacts their lives, their livelihoods, and their health. Some of them know, not everybody does. Your stakeholders need to understand the impact this has on ocean health and how this problem weaves its way into many other aspects of our daily lives. Stakeholders in your community have the power to push decision makers to act. So it's critical, this, this raising awareness is just really, really important. We also wanna see funders make this a priority. Funders need to know that ensuring good water quality is essential for any other conservation goal. Whether it is habitat protection and restoration or fisheries, good water quality is not negotiable. They compromise their investments by ignoring it. We all do. So what is, you know, really what's the point of all of this conservation if it's happening in dirty water? So in the coming months and years, we will be making some noise too. We are going to be raising our voices so that people first understand that we have to end the out of sight, out of mind, flush it and forget it mindset. 
that we need to talk about this problem, put some daylight on it, break down the taboos. Taboos play a very big role in this space so that the problem solvers rise to the challenge, show up and help us work through this. Next slide. Okay, so where does that leave you? What happens next? Well, I'm hoping some of you are recognizing all of this and saying, finally, I'm not alone and there are others out there wanting to do something about this problem. So some of you have been pioneers in this space and are already working on these issues. And if that is the case, please reach out to us. We want to learn from what you have done. We want to share what you have learned with others. Your stories and experiences will serve to inspire and inform those that haven't dipped their toes into this space just yet. However, if you are someone who finds this resonating, you see this problem where you're working or suspect it is an issue, but you don't know where to begin, there is hope and help on the way. That's what we're here for. And we are working right now to assemble everything we have learned in this process so far. We are putting together resources for practitioners that will be available on reefresilience.org and elsewhere over the coming months. And as mentioned, there is this new module in development that is focused on this problem and it gets in much more into the details. There will be an online course available in English, French, and Spanish. There will be case studies available so you can learn about those that are already knee deep in sewage pollution solutions. And we will continue this webinar series, as Kristen mentioned at the beginning of today's session. The case studies will actually be featured prominently in the webinar series. We're also going to be working on awareness campaigns and we will be sharing any resources we develop in that process. The point as always on the Reef Resilience Network is to make your work easier, to reduce the time it takes to learn about new challenges and solutions and to help create the enabling conditions for you to be successful. If there is uh, specific info you're looking for, please do not hesitate to reach out to me directly or the Reef Resilience team, and we will do what we can to connect you to a person or resource if it exists, if we're aware of it. And next slide. Okay, so I think now we're ready for questions and discussion. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Steph. That was um, extremely enlightening and a really helpful, helpful overview to, to kick off this sewage series. So thanks so much. Um, we'd pleasure. now like to open up the webinar for discussion and questions. Remember, you can either send us your question or comment via the question box or raise your hand and we'll unmute you and you can ask your question yourself. Um, in addition to questions, as Steph said, we really welcome sharing about challenges you're experiencing or examples of sewage monitoring, sewage management actions that you're planning or undertaking. The, the point is so that we can learn from each other and generate ideas for the new sewage resources. Um, so I see some, some questions coming in. Um, Steph, let's start with, um, this is a pretty big question, broad, but what is the best way to treat sewage or sewage pollution? Okay, so um, there is no best way. Um, I think the, the easiest thing to remember is any kind of treatment is better than no treatment. And so when you're dealing with more than half of the global population not having any toilet or, or adequate, adequate treatment, just getting some sort of treatment in place is better than no treatment. Um, but, you know, I showed you all of those different tech solutions and there are really so many different things out there. It's a really exciting time in this space for innovation and, and, and you know, we're, we're actually looking at compiling uh, ocean friendly solutions that people can search through and sort of figure out what works for them. But the thing is, is there is no, there's no silver bullet with this because um, everybody has different scenario. They have different social situations, different environmental, geological, hydrological, population density, all of those things vary. So um, there's no one size fits all. But um, one of the things we are trying to do is um, provide guidance so you know where to begin. Even um, we're working to identify groups and organizations that are good resources to help you figure out what works wherever you are. Wonderful. Thanks. Sure. What are the community's perceptions of drinking treated water from sewage? Are they really ready to reuse it again? Excellent. 
So this is a this is interesting. I mean, it's happening, you know, in Orange County in Southern California, which is a very, um, you know, affluent part of the world, in, you know, relatively, and they're doing this. So as long as the water is tested and ensured for safety, just like any water is that's intended for um, uh, drinking and consumption by people, it, it shouldn't be an issue. And I think this is, there are a lot of places, I mean, it really depends on where you are in the world, where water is just scarce to begin with. So recycling water it just is absolutely a no brainer. And, you know, there are parts of the world that flush, you know, we flush drinkable water down the toilet. We do that in the US. People flush their toilets with drinkable water and it's just an extraordinary waste of resources because that water then has to get treated before it can get used for anything. Um, so I think people are ready. Um, I know that um, in this tech uh, contest that um, the Gates Fan Foundation um, initiated, Bill Gates actually, there's a video of him out there drinking a glass of water that came out of the end of the the machine mm -hmm. the toilet that um that purified the water so i think people are getting more comfortable with it and it's a reality and it's i think it's actually an awesome solution because it's such a rare resource for people in anyway thank you uh can you talk a little bit about other diseases coming from sewage so right now, um, I'm not aware, but I really probably should go back and look at the literature um, of any other diseases that have yet to be directly linked to sewage pollution. One of the things, if you're following the disease, coral disease space, you'll find that it's actually really difficult to figure out what caused the disease. There's a lot of mystery around this, and there's a, a huge body of research happening around trying to better understand coral disease. Um, but it, you know, we do know that the pollution makes corals more susceptible to pathogens. The origins of those pathogens, um, you know, are not necessarily clear in many cases. As my, as I understand that, there's it's often even an assemblage of of microorganisms that cause the disease. So um, it's a space where there's a lot more to be known. One of the things I want to emphasize, Kristen, you and I talked about this as we were thinking about this webinar, is we also really wanna hear from people if they have experiences or wanna share anything today. So it doesn't just have to be peppering questions at me. Um, we wanna hear what your experiences have been, um, if any of this rings true or if, it, or if it doesn't. That's also really helpful for us to hear. Absolutely. Um, okay, next question. If the goal is to protect restore coral reefs, where specifically are the priority geographies? How is this determined? Oh my gosh, the, the goal is to, okay, so this is a broader question when we're talking about the goal is to restore coral reefs. Obviously, I think everybody on this call is concerned with protecting coral reefs, improving the conditions that they are facing, but the priority geographies really depends on who you ask. So if the question is more about where the biggest problems are, for this, um, that's something that I think in, in terms of intersection of threat and coral reef biodiversity, that's something that we are gonna have a better understanding of um, when the Ocean Health Index um, study is published. It's, we really are expecting to see this in the next couple of months. Um, but this problem exists almost everywhere we looked. So if you've got people and you've got coral reefs, this is something you should be at least looking at to see if it's something that you need to address. Yeah, totally agree. It seems like it's a priority for everyone everywhere, which is a little overwhelming, but <laughs> wherever, there, wherever there are people. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just want to, a, a couple folks are asking about slides or asking to, to share out some of the resources Steph mentioned. So mm -hmm. I just want to um, make it known we're going to be sharing a recording of this webinar. As soon as the webinar is done, we'll go ahead and send that out. Um, we are also going to be sharing some resources through the network forum, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but just so rest assured, we'll be sharing resources from the presentation. Um, Steph, there's a question here. How can we link sewage pollution solutions with SDG 14? Any specific indicators for monitoring and tracking progress? Yeah, so um, 
you know, I mentioned this interconnection between between um, all of the different SDGs when you look at um, the sanitation and clean water and sanitation SDG and the life underwater SDG. Um, is that 14? And the other one is six. I get them flip-flopped in my brain. Um, right now, this is a space that I think is a real priority. It's We don't currently have... Um, the metrics in place. I know that the Ocean Health Index is um, being used now, there or it's being it, it evaluated for use in actually tracking SDGs on some of the on the Ocean Health um, component of the SDGs. So that is going to be helpful because they're going to now have their whole threat layer and be able to say kind of the condition country by country of of this level of threat and wastewater threat. But it's a space that we're really needing more work on. So there are folks, you know, I mentioned this group that got together last fall to try to understand the space and what our role um, could be there. And there are scientists from that group that are trying to think about this right now, trying to figure out what the thresholds are, understand better um, how we know, you know, if the water needs, if you need to take action and do something about this, or if you're, you know, on the brink, or if you're in great shape. And so there are people working on this, but it's, an area of development. This is all very new. So one of the greatest frustrations I've had, and I mentioned this, there's very little research that documented it. Um, it was just kind of intuitive. People are like, yes, yeah, it's a problem. That's why we monitor water quality, but not really great science laying it out. And so what I'm hoping is as we raise the um, profile of this, we'll start to see a lot more science. I'm already seeing that happen. Um, and that happened with Reef Resilience long ago when we started the Reef Resilience Network back in 2003, 2004. There wasn't a whole lot about Reef Resilience in, in the science literature. And that grew exponentially over a number of years. So we're hoping that by raising awareness here, um, we will learn more and be able to answer those questions better. Sorry, that was a long answer, but we don't know yet. Short answer. <laughs> I see um, an observation or comment from Francisco, and I'm happy to share this for you, um, Francisco, unless you'd like to share this yourself. If you, if you do yeah, want to share this you. yourself, please just raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, but I'll start sharing while you're deciding Thank if you'd like. You know. <laughs> Sorry, Steph. We like to see other faces, so if you want to get on, we'd love to see yes, you and hear other voices directly. Yeah. So I'll, I'll start sharing and then use, uh, raise your hand if you want to chime in. So um, in Puerto Rico, we have a big problem with grease obstructing sanitary lines caused by used cooking oil thrown into the sink. Do you have a similar problem in the U.S.? We fry a lot here in the residence. Uh, don't have grease oh, residents. Yeah, don't have grease traps like the restaurants. Yeah, that's a big problem in the U.S. for sure. Um, I, I've in all of my research and reading, um, this is like one of the the biggest frustrations of sanitation managers and people ma that manage the pipes and um, the systems. They get these big. I, they have a name for them. I can't think of it. It's like fat. Oh, it's something gross, whatever it is. It's just gross. These big globs of, of fat and grease that block the system. And so that's actually a really important awareness thing is talking to people about the fact that you can't treat this water if it's getting blocked by these big fat globs. I can't think of what they're called right now. But um, yeah, so that is a universal, I think this is a universal issue. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Francisco, for that observation. Um, what are the general water quality standards for healthy corals in reference to phosphorus and nitrates in sewage pollution? Okay, again, this is exactly what I was referring to um, a few minutes ago. There isn't as much clarity around this as you would think. And so there is a team um, based out of I guess it's folks at UC Irvine and, U and University of Queensland that are really starting to look at this so that they can give really clear guidance and people can know, all right, we're at our limit. This, we're, we're treading in dangerous territory for coral health. So um, there, there aren't really 
well-established guidelines out there for reefs. So we're working on that to get, to, get, to get the clarity. Yeah. We have a rough range, but we need to, I think people really want to get more specific. So we're working on that. The collective we, I always like to say. Okay, speaking of sanitation solutions that convert toilet waste to water plants, has treated wastewater been used for farming purposes and has it been successful? Yeah, treated wastewater is definitely used for farming, um, not just the water, but also um, you can derive fertilizer from human sewage. Uh, there are, you, people do use fecal sludge sometimes. I don't know if that's a term that's familiar to people. It's become very familiar to me. Um, there can be issues with that. Um, so it, it all, with all of this, it depends on doing it the right way. The, if you're using fecal sludge or if you're using um, the, the water, you do need to treat it and remove things that you don't want to get into your food. So if you don't want, you don't want heavy metals, heavy metals need to be removed. Um, as an example. So it is, um, there is actually a really fun um, podcast on Radio Lab. So if you're, Radio Lab is a US based um, sort of science, science podcast. Um, and they do one on the poop train. So if you want to be entertained and learn about how New York City at one point was transporting its human waste out west in the western part of the US and fertilizing farms, you can learn about that but it is definitely happening and it's just a matter of making sure it's safe. You're not creating a disease issue or a other sort of toxin contamination contamination. Awesome. Thanks, Steph. Kitty, I see an odds and a question here from you. I'm happy to read it, but if you'd like to ask your question yourself, um, just, just raise your hand. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and start, but please pipe in if, if you're interested. Water quality can be a tricky political issue in tourism areas, particularly in places where local governments would rather downplay poor water quality than risk a hit to their location's reputation. What suggestions do you have for raising a discussion about poor water quality in places where local officials don't want to address it, citing the economy as the reason? and uh, Kitty is in Indonesia. Okay, so Kitty, this is obviously a problem in any tourist-based economy, which co most coral reefs have a really strong tourist-based economy. Not all, but many. And there, we've had a lot of discussion about this because there's obviously a strategy that um, we could use that's not a great one for partner relationships, which is name and shame. You know, there are, efforts out in there in the world that monitor and then call out whenever there is a, a problem. So where I have lived on the coast, you get an alarm, you get a warning when we've had a lot of rain and um, the water is no longer swim, swimmable. And that happens almost every time it rains where, where I've been living on the coast. Um, we get a warning so we know the beaches aren't safe. And um, not, at, not that the tourists generally don't get that warning, the, the local residents are more aware of it. But if tourists knew how often our water wasn't safe to swim in, that would certainly deter their um, interest in visiting. And so I guess the challenge is having a more um, uh, complicated, perhaps, conversation around the fact that linking the experience a tourist has, getting sick in a place um, because the water was not safe, may, you may get that tourist visiting one time because they had a problem and they, and they don't return. So it may affect return visits. Um, it's, it's an important conversation to have. So you don't wanna start off by saying, hey, we're gonna tell everybody you guys have this problem. You wanna start off by saying, this is a risk to your industry. I mean, we've already seen such um, shifts in what's going on with the pandemic around tourism and public health. People are appreciating the importance of public health, the importance of safety, and um, it's becoming just something that everybody is better versed in. So having that more complicated conversation about the fact that they're risking their, their business by not attending to the water quality um, in their, you know, if it's a hotel, a lot of times they, they treat their own waste. So um, 
that's very kind of convoluted answer, but we're, we are thinking about ways to partner with the tourism industry specifically that, that are positive. And so that's something that's under development. And as we come up with ideas and learn how it's worked in other places, we will share it. Um, but you don't want to have the reputation of being a place that everybody gets sick. And so, um, especially these days. So, yeah, so that's acknowledged and we're thinking a lot about it. Thanks, Steph. Um, so here's an observation and question from Florida in the US. In the Miami-Dade County, 90% of solids are removed from the wastewater stream and repurposed as fertilizer. The remainder is chlorinated and placed in the Gulf Stream. The majority of residential are nutrients. Would you consider the disposal, or would you consider this disposal method bad for the ocean? What are the harmful effects? Not to put you on the spot. But yeah, so I would, I probably would want to, I am a little bit familiar with what they're doing in South Florida. Actually, one of the images I showed was from a pipe that was off the coast of Jupiter-ish area. Um, where they used to, they were just doing primary treatment and piping the sewage off into the oceans. I know that the public awareness around that has shifted some of, I think they're shutting down a lot of those pipes because people found out about it and got pretty freaked out about the fact that they were just removing solids and, you know, shipping them out to sea. Um, but, you know, it really has to do with the, with the condition of that water. Is that water clean of pathogens and nutrients um, and the other harmful components of sewage, then that sounds like a reasonable uh, strategy. Um, and it's great that they're using the solids for farming or fertilization, um, for fertilizer. So yeah, every, every place is gonna have a different solution. They also have a lot going on just north of Miami-Dade using constructed wetlands. So I don't know for the person who um, wrote in, there's some pretty cool examples happening in Palm Beach and um, looking at really large scale constructed wetlands that are actually visited. They're like used as, um, you know, a park where people show up. It's a wetland park and people go see the birds and the gators and whatever's there. And you would never know it's a treatment, wastewater treatment center. So there's, there's a lot of different solutions out there. But the key for oceans is getting, making sure that it doesn't have the harmful pathogens and toxins in it and the excess nutrients. Steph, a couple, well, a number of questions came in around constructed wetlands. So I don't know if you wanna mm -hmm. talk about that, maybe one, one or two more sentences, if there are any mm -hmm. other examples, um, or if you do think that's a good option for, for sewage treatment. I think it's a great option for sewage treatment. Um, actually, when, my, my first job at the Nature Conservancy was in St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And um, the first year we were there, we worked with a local organization to build a constructed wetland for our, our office, basically. And so um, I had a direct experience with it. It treated our sewage. It provided habitat. There was no unpleasantness about it. It wasn't like, you know, odorous or you know it wasn't a problem it was actually a little a place that people like to visit because birds you know like the habitat so i had a you know a personal experience with it um you have to have enough supply to a constructed wetland for it to make sense um, because you need the just the whole microbial processes that happen in that system um they, you have to feed it with the with the bacteria that it needs to, to function but um, I've seen, that was a small scale, that was just for our office, but then I've seen it working in, you know, South Florida on a very large scale where I wandered around this wetland treatment plant. Um, as mentioned, we are working with a group of sanitation experts, um, most of them are actually in Europe, but we're part of a working group at the Nature Conservancy to identify the best natural solutions, so that's obviously one of them um, that managers can use and that will be a searchable resource for folks fairly soon. It should be coming online in the next couple of months. So it's something to explore and to consider to see if it makes sense for wherever you are. Thank you. There were 
a number of questions that have come in around behavior change, just kind of citing or kind of reaffirming the importance of it, but also sharing some examples of how challenging it mm -hmm. is. Uh, I wanted to share one example. I was involved in some public health work in Guatemala years ago, and one of our problems was education. Villagers would respond to us that their grandparents had used the rivers for their disposal and that they were still alive today, so why should they change? Education on a village level is a very key component. Yes, and that, yeah, totally agree. Um, that is one of those core cultural norms that are really important um, to appreciate in all of this. So there's no miracle toilet that comes in and solves this problem for the places that don't already have toilets. Um, the, you know, in some, in some countries, it's a social endeavor. So going to open defecation is a com is is common practice. There's um, I think it's about fifteen percent of the world. Is that right? It's about a billion people I think that still uh, practice open defecation, and it's social. Now, and where I live and where I've worked, this is not social. This is private business. But if that's part of your social structure, and you go to the river and you see your friends and you do your business then that's a big shift, right, in, in behavior that needs to be addressed. Now, the argument in that particular case would be, sure, the, the families that were using the river were great, but what happened to the families downriver and how did they, how were they affected? So a lot of this is just understanding how these systems interact and how what you do impacts others, and maybe how what happens upstream is an issue. And even in the Guatemala issue I, uh, situation, I would probably ask, okay, so what was in sewage 50 years ago is different than what's there now. And the harmful chemicals and um, the increase in pathogens um, certainly uh, has changed over time. Yeah, sorry, Kristen, I'm just rambling on, so. No, this is wonderful. I'm overwhelmed by the number of questions that uh, are here, which is fabulous. And um, there are yet yeah, too many questions for us to get to, but really interesting questions around um, sewage and cruise ships. There, um, thank you so much for everyone sharing examples. Um, there are some links to different studies. Uh, there's one from St. John, U.S. Virgin Islands, um, a, a study assessing current treatment systems being used by residents. So wonderful, we'll look into that. Um, I'll just do one more question. Uh, let's see, is there worry regarding the safety of chemicals used in sewage treatment plants to treat the water? Are there any instances where treated water is having a negative impact on marine habitats? So this is not something I've really come across. Um, a lot of what happens in a treatment plant, so if you're thinking about the sort of centralized sewer treatment plants, it's a lot of microbial activity that's, and they create the space for, um, and, and accelerate the process of treating, um, treating the sewage. So, and then the types of treatments they use now, they do use chlorine in some cases, but more safe options are UV light, um, there, are, there are options that are not an issue in terms of chemicals and going into the environment, but that's kind of like the highest level of treatment and not necessarily the most realistic or even desirable option. So one thing that I want people to leave today with is if you're in a place that doesn't have a centralized treatment plant with a centralized sewer system, that is okay. What has is pretty well understood across in this space is that that's not necessarily an ideal for a whole bunch of reasons. Much smaller decentralized systems are more realistic, and more beneficial, and more likely to last and work over the long term. So um, yeah, I mean, I think the bigger concern is what was already in the water um, before it went through treatment rather than what goes into the water through the treatment process. Thank you. Um, and I just want to share one last observation uh, that ties back to the Indonesia tourism question or comment. We had a massive 48 million gallon sewage spill in Honolulu in 2006, and it mm -hmm. shut down the beaches for a week and made international headlines. So it was a wake up call about the importance of water quality. So yeah. I'll 
Thank you everyone for your questions. Yeah. I'm really sorry to have to wrap up the discussion session, um, but our hour is up and I wanna be mindful of everyone's time. I know it's very late in some time zones. Um, we do encourage you to continue this conversation on the Reef Resilience Network discussion forum. This is our interactive online community of reef managers and practitioners from around the world. You can go to reefresilience.org and click on the network tab, or you can see the link there on the screen to log in or sign up for the forum. We have posted a list of sewage resources here, so you'll see a tab, um, I think we called it just that, Ocean Sewage Resources. So the some of the papers that Steph referenced during her talk, as well as a, um, one of our partners, Partners, current ocean sewage resource hub is, is linked there. We will um, post the recording of the webinar there as well. But for all the questions and comments that we didn't get a chance to address, please um, go to that post, share them directly there. It's a, it's a great way for you to um, see the questions and comments from, from your peers and we will address those. And please share any ideas um, as both Steph and I have mentioned we're looking for your ideas and um, your needs to really help guide uh, the development of the resources that we're working on. So that's a great place to, to share those as well. Um, we will be, the, as soon as the webinar is done, there will be a three question survey to get your feedback on the topic of sewage. So please, um, please take that survey and, and share your feedback. Once again, we'll use that information to guide development of our resources. And as Steph mentioned, our next webinar in the series is Wastewater 101 with Chris Clapp, and that will be on September 30th. So hope to see you all then. But thank you so much, Steph. That was wonderful. I really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for all of your questions and participation. And we'll see you all in a few weeks. Any final words, Steph? I just, it was a pleasure to be here and I'm excited to talk more, you know, more potty talk with anybody that is interested. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a really fun conversation. It's really complex and um, there's a lot more to come. So we look forward to having you guys join us. Yeah. Thanks for making a kind of depressing topic. <laughs> fun. I don't oh, know if it's fun, but so fun. Trust me. It's, yeah. It's lots of fun to be had. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all. Bye.